You're, you, he is love. That's his, that's his natural state of being. But he also chose to love you. He, he chose you to, to receive his love. Are you getting a sense of how important you are? Amen. You should. Right now, you ought to be thinking, you know what? I must be pretty special. I know that's what I'm thinking right now. Not because, not be, not because of my gifts or my abilities or because of, of any of that, but, but because of him and because of, because of how much he chooses to love me. Is, is, that's that's the, the... I told you we were swimming in the ocean today. Because that, this is what this is like. You can't see land. You can't touch the bottom right now. All you can do is, is just lay back on your back and float. In the, in the ocean of God's love. In the, in the, in the over... You're like you're out in the middle of the ocean. There's no ships around. There's no land in sight. It's just you in the ocean. It's just you and God's love. And, and it is totally surrounding you. And, it, and it's, it's just, just enjoy it. Just enjoy that presence and that sense of, of, of the awesomeness of the, the, the incredible power of the love of God. So, so there's that. Now, I was, uh, I was, I was reading in the book of Joshua this week. This would have been uh, yesterday morning. And uh, you all familiar with the story of Ai? You remember the little city Ai? Those of you that are, I'll try to get through this as quick as I can. This isn't really part of the sermon, but it's going to be part of communion a little bit. So I feel like I, I, I don't understand why God speaks to me the way he does, but he does. So... So in the, in the story, in the book of Joshua, chapter, I think it's 7 or 8, after the Israelites had come into the promised land, remember Jericho? Everybody knows about Jericho. They marched around the city seven times. The walls all caved in, and, and uh, the only person that was saved was Rahab and so forth. Well, in that story, God told the, the Israelites, he said, everything in Jericho belongs to me. All the people, all the gold, all the all the plunder, everything belongs to me. I don't want you touching any of it. None of it is for your use. I don't want you going. He said, I want you to go in there and make sure all the people are dead, but I don't want you taking any of the plunder. And so the, the city of Jericho was was belonged to God. And uh, so God brought the, the he, he brought the victory. They they went into Jericho. They they made sure everyone in the city had, had died. And, uh, but one man by the name of Achan saw something and he took it. You read, read the story, you know that Achan saw some, he saw some, some clothes and some gold and he thought, you know what, nobody's looking, I'm just going to take this for myself. And he touched something that was, that was uh, uh, sacred to God. And in a sense, he touched God's glory. And, and of course, disaster happened. And uh, by the way, in, in the book of Joshua, if you want some good sermon material, read the first 15 chapters of Joshua. There's like 800 sermons in, that, in those 15 chapters. Uh, but, but Achan saw something that he wasn't supposed to have. He took it, hid it in his tent, didn't tell anybody, and disaster took place because the next city that the Israelites were supposed to, to uh, capture the, as they came into the promised land was this little city, by, it, it was called Ai. Uh, literally two letters, Ai. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the name of the city. It was a small little, little city, smaller than Jericho. And uh, so Joshua, not knowing what Achan had done, not knowing there was sin in the camp, he decided, he thought, you know, Ai is just a small little city. We don't need to send the whole army up there to attack them. We can just send a few soldiers. Ai will, 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 will be captured. We're, 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 we have all this momentum going now. We've captured Jericho. And God, uh, God uh, so Joshua decided to just send 3,000 men up to attack Ai, not knowing there was sin in the camp. But because there was sin in the camp, the, the little city of Ai 
came out and attacked the army that had gone up to attack them, the Israelite army, and the Israelites were defeated. So here they are. they just come into the promised land. They've, they've been obedient to God. They've, they've seen God do this miraculous thing where they crossed the Jordan River on dry ground. They saw the city of Jericho literally defeated with, just by marching around. And then all of a sudden, they run into a, 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 an enemy that they should easily have defeated, only there was sin in the camp. And they were defeated. So Joshua and the Israelites, they fall on their face before God, and they say, God, what's going on? How can we take over the promised land if we can't even defeat this little city of Ai? This does not bode well for us. It, we're, this is not a good thing. And so God said, well, the problem is you got sin in the camp, and they, they uh, through a, a process of, of uh, casting lots, they determined who it was and what he had done, and finally they got that all straightened out. Achan and his family uh, were put to death because of Achan's sin, and the sin in the camp was eliminated. It was dealt with. And then God told Joshua, he said, okay, now that that's taken care of, now we can keep going. I told you there was a whole bunch of sermons. I just spoke about eight different sermons right there. If you break that all down, it's incredible. But So God, God told Joshua, he said, Here's what, I'm going to give you a plan how to conquer Ai. And so what he did, he laid this out for him, and he said, I want you to send part of the army around behind Ai and have them, have them uh, lay in hiding where nobody can see them. He said an ambush. And he said, in the morning, I want you, Joshua, to take the rest of the army, and I want you to attack Ai from the front. And as you attack the city of Ai, because they defeated you yesterday, they're going to think that they can defeat you again. And when they come out of the city to attack you, I want you to pretend like you're being routed again. And he said, I want you to, to this was the plan God gave Joshua. He said, pretend like they're winning and you and the, and the army that's with you start to run from them, flee from them. He said, what will happen is the men of Ai, the, the, the soldiers of Ai, will pursue you and they'll leave the city unguarded and then the men that are in ambush will be able to sneak in after the city is left open with nobody to guard it and they will be able to defeat the city. Once they're in the city, they can set it on fire and when the army that's running turns around and sees the fire, they'll know that the city has now been captured and the guys that were pretending to run can turn around and you'll have the army in a, in a trap. And that's exactly what they did. So I was reading this story, and, and uh, I've always loved this, the book of Joshua anyway, because it's a story of great victories and, and how God honors his people and God takes care of his people. So as I was reading this story, I noticed that when God told Joshua the plan, he was very specific. This is how cool God is. He said, he said when, when the men who are, who are being put in ambush, he said they are to go to the west side of the city. Now those of you, if you're like me, you, you pretty much always know where north, south, east, and west is. I don't know why, but that seems to be just something that I know. Most of the time, no matter where I'm at, I can tell you where north is. I can, it's just like part of like an internal thing. My wife is the opposite of that. She never knows where north is. If I asked her to point to north, she could point a hundred different directions. Now, I don't know if this is a... How many of you men are like that? Where you pretty much always know where north and south and east... How many of you women don't ever know that? Okay, that's what I thought. Most... Yeah, Tammy. I don't know. I point up. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, I don't know if it's a man-woman thing, but for some reason, I, north, north is that way. I know yeah. that. I okay. know that I'm in my living. Yeah, when you're in the yeah. living room. But if we were going in the dining room, she wouldn't know. <laughs> the sun's out, we know. Yeah. Yes, yes. The sun's out. Okay. Anyway, that's not part of the message. <laughs> but anyway, so God said, God, God told you can close that if that's getting too annoying. Uh, so, so, 
So I'm reading this story, and, and God was very specific with Joshua. He said, the men that are sitting in ambush, I want them to go to the west side of the city. And I'm reading this, and I'm thinking, why is that important? Why did, why did, why did we need, I don't know where AI is, and it, it, it doesn't exist anymore. It was wiped out by the, the Israelites that night, that day. This is the end of AI. It doesn't exist anymore. I have no idea the geography of AI, but yet in the Bible, it, it told Joshua, it said, make sure the men in the city that are in ambush, put them on the west side. So, honey, if north is there, where's west? West is there. West is there. Okay, good. <laughs> this is west. That's right. So, a 50-50 chance. Okay, so I'm reading the story, and I'm thinking, all of a sudden, when I'm reading the story, Holy Spirit told me, said, this is important for you to... to Pay attention to this direction that I gave Joshua. And I'm thinking, this is like 6,000 years ago. Why is it important to me today? But he said, just pay attention to, to the direction. So I, I, as I'm reading the story, God said the, the men in ambush were on the west side of the city. The men that were going to attack the city, Joshua and the rest of the armies, they were to position themselves to the north of the city. Now I'm assuming that the north of the city was where the main gate was. Cities back then had walls around yeah, them. Right. Mm -hmm. They didn't have tanks and artillery and that kind of thing. So in order to protect the city, what you do is build a wall around it, and the, the wall would go all the way around the city, but it would have one main gate, one big gate. And so I'm assuming that Joshua was told to go to the north, and I'm assuming that the city faced that way and that the men in ambush were to the west. Okay, now stay with me. There's, I'm, I'm, this all became important to me. Might not be important to you, but it came important to me. So, so I'm, I asked God. I said, "Why is that important?" He said, "Just, just put this in the back of your mind. This north and west, north and west thing." One of the things I, I thought of immediately was that the salvation of God was coming. If Joshua was facing. South, he was on the north side, he's facing the people on the west were on the right hand. Mm -hmm. And it was a picture of the salvation of God coming from God's right hand. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. the, because that often God talks about in the Bible how he's going to raise up his hand against his enemies. Well, it's his right hand, it's his sword hand. Yes. And so the, the first thing I thought of was, well, Joshua, the, the, the salvation of the Israelites was going to be on the right. It was God's right hand. I thought that was the message. I, that, I didn't think any more about it. Uh, so I had this whole northwest thing going on yesterday, and I'm, I'm reading this story about Joshua. But remember, I woke up Friday morning, and God was pouring into me about his love. And uh, so he took me over to the book of 1 John. And the first the book of first second uh, first John is five chapters long, but it's an incredible treatise on 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 the love of God. It's uh, it's sort of an unusual book in the Bible. There's there's no real uh, literary structure to the book of first John. It it's it if you read it and reread it and reread it, you'll notice that 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 it, it sort of it sort of wanders. From there, there's a couple main points that the writer uh, keeps reiterating and talking about. And uh, most people believe that the, the book of 1 John was written by the Apostle John, uh, jo the, the disciple that was referred to as the, the beloved disciple, uh, because the language in 1 John, a lot of it sounds and has the, has the same feel to it that the book of John did. And uh, in, in uh, 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. That, that whole verse sounds very familiar to John chapter 1. Mm -hmm. Remember John chapter 1, In the beginning was God, in the beginning was the word, and so forth and so on which sounds a lot like Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created. So the, a, lot of, a lot of 
Bible scholars and people believe that the author was John the beloved disciples. Nobody knows for sure, but that's that's what they believe because a lot of the language is similar to, to the book of John. But one of the things that that uh, the, 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 the book of 1 John was written to a, a sort of a group of churches in, in the uh, area of Ephesus, same place that Paul wrote his letter to the Ephesians. And uh, John was writing, or the, the writer John was writing to these churches, and what had happened is that the, 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 the churches there had been sort of infiltrated with, with false teaching. There, and, and it doesn't explain exactly how or why it happened, but somehow in the church, false teachers had come in, and, and uh, man being man, they loved that feeling of, of being important. And so these false teachers had come in, and they had led the people away from, from what they had been told about God. Mm-hmm. The, first, the thing that they had been told about God was the very thing that God told me this way. Jesus loves you. That was the foundation of the whole church. That was the very, that's the the, the bedrock solid foundation that the church of Jesus is built on. Mm -hmm. Jesus loves you. That's where we get Jesus saves from, Dave. Mm -hmm. Because if Jesus didn't love us, he wouldn't wouldn't be able to save us. Mm -hmm. So, So the church that John knew and the church that he probably had had a hand in founding or starting these little home churches, they didn't have, you know, the Baptist church and the Catholic church and the Methodist church and the Presbyterians and the Church of God and the, uh, the Assemblies of God. They didn't have 800 different versions of the church back then. They only had the church. They only had the, the people that had heard about Jesus. And so, so as John was writing to this church, he was... he. The, the whole book of First John is, is an attempt to bring the people back to what they had originally been taught. Mm. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing today, right now in this living room. He's reminding us of the foundation of what we were built on, yes. who we are, yes. what we are. Yes. We are the loved ones of Jesus. Amen. We are the ones that God loves. And so the, the entire book of 1 John was written about the love of God. It's like a treatise. It's about, it's about, uh, it's about restoring or reminding the church of this, this very simple yet very profound truth that you are loved by God. Amen. And he goes, he, the way the book is written... He keeps coming back to that over and over again. He talks, he talks about, about God being light. And then he, then he ties in to that how because God is light, he is love. And he keeps coming back to these same basic simple things. It's a very simple basic truth, but it's, it's very profound. If you know somebody that's a brand new Christian... That, that, uh, that has just gotten saved and they don't know anything at all about God. One of the, one of the very first books of the Bible they should read is the book of John. Yes. Mm-hmm. The book of John. That's, the e- that's one of the easiest books in the Bible to read, the book of John, especially for a new Christian. Mm-hmm. It's just very fundamental, very basic, and it, it really does a good job of sort of setting your foundational truth mm-hmm. that you can live your life on second book you might want to tell them to read is the book of 1st John Mm. because it deals with such basic simple things now if you've been saved for a minute like most of us in the room have you've been saved for a while some of us have been saved all our lives you know what books we need to read John (laughs) and 1st John why because no matter how many times you read it, no matter how many times you hear it, you need to hear it again. Yeah. Yes. You need to be reminded yeah. yes. that, that everything else that I am, everything else I know about God, is based on this. Yes. Yes. 
And so John reminds the, the whole book of 1 John is the story, or the, uh, it's, uh, it's, not just, it's not the story, it's just, it's the idea, it's the concept of the love of God. Mm. The, the cool thing about that is no matter how many times you read it, you're still not going to know all about it. Mm. Dave, you're an expert on the love of God. Amen. Because you live in it, mm -hmm. right? You walk in it. You're, mm -hmm. you're a very simple guy. Mm -hmm. You are. I mean, you you never strike me as somebody that, like, talks about stuff way over your head. Most of the time when I talk to you, you talk about how much God loves you. Mm -hmm. You boil it down to its very simplest thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. But you always tell me you don't know anything about it. But I'm learning. you're learning. That's right. You're learning. Same thing's true with everybody in the room. No matter how much you think you know right. about it, yeah. you don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. just you're just finding out. Yeah. You're just learning. Mm -hmm. So the, the, what's that? That's how massive it is. It is. Yes. It's it's a, it's just a, it's such a cool thing. It's yeah. deep. So, I've, I've been, now remember, all of this, I've only had a couple days to, to let this soak into me. And I've really, I've really, I've been reading 1 John the, the last 24 hours, I've read it several times, and I still can't, I still can't, I can't boil it all down into a verse, or a couple verses, and it's a hard from a, from a, uh, just being a preacher, it's a hard message to preach because I don't have, like, a, a good, if you want to preach a good sermon, you need to have, like, three note, three points, and, and an application. You make those three points, you stand up, you tell the people what you're going to tell them, then you tell the people, then you tell the people what you told them, and then you, you pray and say amen, and you, you go have something deep. Uh, you know what? This is not that today. Because John and First John are good enough. Yeah. yeah. So, so I don't, I don't have, I don't, I don't, I, 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 I'm sorry, but I don't have. You need to read the whole book, is what I'm saying. Right. You need to read it several times. You need to let it. You need to let it just. So you need to swim in the ocean. If you really want to, if you really want to, if you want to know the ocean. The best way to know the ocean is swimming. You can read all the books about it. You could, you, you know, here we are in Ohio. We live in the middle of Ohio. There's no ocean within 100 miles of here. And so we could read all about it. You could watch documentaries on it. You could talk to experts. You could go to college universities, and you could have college professors explain to you about how how salty it is and how ma how many. You could probably find out. I'm sure by now somebody's counted the number of fish in it, and they could tell you how 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 many different kinds of fish, and they could tell you how many gallons of water is in it. They could they could do all the facts and details. You could. Study that, study it, and study it. But trust me on this. You will never know what the ocean's like until you go there and swim in it. Until you go there and experience it. It's something, and once you've been there, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you've ever been to the ocean, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's just it's something you have to experience. That's the way it is with God's love. I cannot teach you about this. I cannot, I cannot give you enough details or explanations or uh, facts about it to whereby you'll experience it. You have to get into it. You have to swim in it. But here's, the, here's a couple things I want to give you. I'm going to forget about trying to find verses. And I'm just going to tell you what God showed me through the book of 1 John. First, first thing he showed me is everything I've been talking about. And that's that God loves you. That's it. God, that's just, it is just you are loved. You live in it. It's all around you. It's available to you 24-7. There's nobody that can stop it. There's nobody that can, can, can keep you away from it. You can't keep yourself away from it. You can't. It's just there. There's no measuring it. There's nobody that can, can turn it on and off with a valve whereby they can starve you out of it. No matter what the preacher says, 
you, God's love, I'm going to say something really profound. Get ready. God's love is available to you if you want it. All you have to do is receive it. Yes. You, you say, but you don't know what I've done. God knows what you've done. He knows what you did yesterday. He knows what you're doing right now. And he knows what you're going to do tomorrow. And yet, Jim, he still loves you. Yes. Thank Just you. pouring it all over you. And it's available to you whenever, wherever you want it. It's a powerful thing. You read 1 John, you'll see that in there. Now, the second, the second thing that, that John talks about is he talks about the correlation between you receiving God's love and how much you give it out to somebody else. Okay, now, you need to listen very carefully to the Holy Spirit here for a few minutes. Because this is where the liar comes in and tries to twist this thing around yeah. and confuse us and, and get us off track. Yeah. Because there's a correlation between you <coughs> receiving the love of God or walking. When I say receiving, I'm talking about just simply breathing it in. Yeah. Living in it. Yeah. That's, when I say receive it, that, there, there's, no, there's no secret who type things you got to jump to to receive God's love. No formula. It's just, you just, you just, there it is. You live in it. Just like breathing air. But, there's a correlation between how much of God's love you can actually live in and how much you're willing to give out. Because that's what 1 John says. He talks over and over in there. He talks about how because God loved us, that means that we're supposed to love everybody else. Yeah. Now, this is, this is a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> now, uh, who do I want to pick on here? <laughs> I'll pick on Scott. <laughs> Scott and Kathy. Okay? Now, it's easy for me to love Kathy. Amen. She's lovely. Yes. <laughs> Scott, <laughs> sometimes you're, it could you're be. You're lovely too. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love Scott. <laughs> but you know how you know how some people are easier to love than others? Oh, yeah. And, and, and it's all different for all of us, according to our personalities, yeah. according to, to maybe what's happened to us. Some of us, some of us love some people easier. It's easier for us to love some people than it is for us to love others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, when, when John said that we're supposed to love everybody, he didn't give us that option. Mm -hmm. yeah. He said, if you want to... If you want to understand, if you want to walk in and receive and live in the fullness of God's love, then there's a correlation to that and how much you're willing to love others right. yeah. is basically what it boils down to. Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Now, this, this has became very real to me this week. I'm not going to tell you my sin, but I'm close to it. <laughs> Everybody in this room has been hurt at some point in their life. Yes. Yeah. Some of us recently. Yeah. Okay. Maybe maybe some of you today. Maybe yesterday. Maybe this week. Maybe this month. Maybe this year. But I guarantee you, if you, every one of us have suffered or endured hurt or pain from that that came from somebody else. Okay, now remember I told you about the north and the west? Yeah. I'm going to tell you why that became important to me this morning. Because God was telling me, he said, if you want to walk in, in the, the total 
love that is available to you. And by the way, by the way, I don't think I do yet. I'm wanting to. I'm, 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 really, I'm really wanting to be able to in, in, enjoy more of God's love. Because there's so much that goes along with it. And, and so, so I'm, I'm, I'm really wanting to be able to, to fully be immersed in it. But here's the problem. I have pain in my life. Yeah. I've been hurt by people. Right. But God said, you got to love everybody. Yes. Amen. So I'm sitting in my chair this morning, right where Connie's sitting. It's my chair. This is where I hang out with God. <laughs> him, and, him and I sit here. And when I sit in this chair, now it's hard to tell because there's a fire going on over there. Connie, and it sort of mars a little bit. But when I sit in this chair, I look out this window. And when, I, when, I'm, when I'm sitting with God and I'm swimming in the ocean and I'm swimming with God and I'm looking out this window, I see, what I see all the time is the beauty of God. Because if, if you, after church, you guys can come over here and look, but when you look out this window where she's sitting, all you see is nature. All, you see grass, you see fields, you see there's nothing man-made over here. From, from my chair. I'm sitting here this morning. I just had this revelation. So I'm sitting here and I'm looking out the west. The west. Remember the west? Mm -hmm. So I'm looking out the west and what I'm seeing is, is everything. Now, if I stand here, you can see buildings and, and like people and stuff like that. From my chair, I can't see any of that. All I can see is trees and grass and fields and growing things. I can see I can see everything that God made that's beautiful. I can see creation. And that's what I experienced out on my porch Friday morning. I experienced creation. It was like God showed me the the perfect the perfectness of his creation in that moment. Now I know I know we're living in a fallen world and I know that we haven't experienced the fullness of that. Even on the even Friday morning I didn't experience the fullness of it, but I experienced something that was really closer to it because in that moment I I, I just I just had that sense of wow what a beautiful world God created. And I could picture the Garden of Eden. And when I sit in my chair where you're sitting, Connie, I can see that. I can see God's perfect creation. And it's a little bit like Niagara Falls, because if you go up to Niagara Falls, you know, it's so powerful and the water's roaring over there. But, you know, you're not really seeing it in all of its raw power. Yeah. Because they're only letting about 10% of the water come over Niagara Falls now of what originally used to be there. Yeah. They've diverted the, the water around it for some reason. I think it has to do with making electric or whatever. But... They say that, the, that the, the Niagara Falls was actually way more powerful than what you see today. That's another one of those things. If you ever could get a chance, go up there and see it. It's a powerful thing. But, but experiencing creation is a little bit like that. When we experience creation, like I did Friday, I'm still only seeing it as a, a partial. Not until we get to heaven are we going to see God's perfect creation. But when I sit in my chair and I look out to the west, that's what I see. I see God's perfect creation. It's easy for me to love that. It's easy for me to love when I sit in my chair and I look out and I see the perfection of God. Yeah. It's easy for me to, to feel God's love. Yeah. But when I look out the north window, mm -hmm. I realize all of a sudden when I look out this window, I see the very thing that sort of, I don't want to say it destroyed creation because it didn't destroy it, but it marred it. It, it, it put a stain on creation because, because the, the, the world that God created in his love, the world that love created was perfect. We know the story from Genesis chapter 3. We know how the liar came in. And we know how the liar introduced darkness and death to the world. How did he did that? How did he do that? He didn't do it through the through the grass and the trees and the animals. He did it through mankind. And so when I look out this window, you know what I see? 
I see the effects of man. I see buildings and houses and, and people. I see cars driving by. And I see the imperfection that came into creation through sin. But God said, if you want to walk in the fullness of my love. By the way, I'll say this again. I don't know that we'll ever experience that total fullness until we get to heaven. Right now I'm thinking not. But I think we can experience it more fully. Not because... He loves us more fully. Now listen very, very carefully to what I'm saying. Don't hear something I'm not saying. Because when I, before when I read 1 John, I sort of equivocal, like sort of, I saw this and I thought, well, the more I love people, the more God loves me. That's not what it says. No. God cannot love you any more than he already does. Right. Come on, that's good. You cannot earn God's love no. by loving Tammy. <clears throat> That's not, it's not how it works. You don't, you don't cause God to love you more. What you do is you open yourself up to allowing more of God's love to infuse you, to penetrate into you, to, to live inside you, to enjoy his goodness and enjoy the, all of the pleasures and, and great things that come with God love, God's love. You open yourself when you open yourself to love other people. Yes. Mm -hmm. That includes the people that hurt you. Mm. Now the reason I keep saying that is because those are the hardest people to love. Yeah. Brenda, you know about hurt. Mm -hmm. You know about it. You experienced it. Betty, you know about hurt. Mm -hmm. you, you endured some pain. Tammy, you know about hurt. You, you, I, I'm sharing their stories because they've shared with me. I know some of their story and I know some of the things. I could go around the room. I could, each one of us, I'm sure we could all share things people hurt us. Things, maybe it was intentional. Maybe it was unintentional. Maybe it was accidental. It doesn't really matter. The pain is still there. And what the liar wants is he wants you to take that pain and he wants you to close yourself off thinking you got to protect yourself. Because what that, look it. When you close yourself off, you're closing yourself off from allowing God's love to permeate you. Yes. Yeah. This is just, it, it's simple, but it's so profound. If you want to receive, you have to open yourself. When you open yourself, you have to be willing for God's love to pour out of you into everybody else. I literally, this week, this morning, had to stand here and I had to go from the west and face the north. I'm not saying, this was how Holy Spirit showed me. Remember I told you this is a very intimate moment for me. I don't know how he's going to explain it to you, but I had to stand here to the west and, and, and look out at, at the perfection and then face the people, yeah. the, the, the hurt in my life. Right. Is that, does that make any sense? Because that, and I'm not, I'm not telling you it doesn't hurt. Because it hurts. Yeah. The pain is real. Yes. I, I, I get that. But what I'm saying is if you don't open yourself up and let that love of God pour out on the people that hurt you. Yeah. Yeah. This is the key. As painful as it is, as, as hurtful as it is, that, that, that you, when you get hurt by somebody, your, your natural reaction is to want to hurt them back. Yeah. Or at least close yourself yeah. off. To not wish them good. Yeah. But when you do that, when you look at what happens. Right. When you close yourself off, nothing can come in. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're, you, you maybe are, are keeping yourself from experiencing more hurt somehow. You're not really because the pain's already inside of you. That's right. And really all you're doing is locking it inside of you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's some of you in this room, you're like me, you've been hurt deeply. And this pain, some of you, this goes all the way back to childhood. Yeah. And, you know, we, we sometimes make light of it and think, oh, you know, I, I, I just need to get over it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying you should get over it. I'm just saying you need to open yourself up. Yeah. And you need to let God's love pour out towards the people that have hurt you. I don't know who that is. I, they have a name. Yeah. You you probably know the name of the pe the person or the people. Some of us have a whole list of people that hurt us. Some of those are small hurts. Some of them are big hurts. Some of them are, are, are uh, maybe a little more shallow. Some of them are deep, 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 painful things. But what God showed me this week, he said, he said, you need... To start, he said, you need to start experiencing love in your heart for those people. Yes. To the north. Mm. Now, here's something he showed me. He said, it starts in your heart, not in your head. Mm. Because right away, you want to go to your head. Yeah. Because... For some reason, we feel like our head determines our heart. No, your heart determines your head. So if you're going to, if you're going to love somebody, especially somebody that doesn't deserve it, because they don't deserve it, they hurt you. They they cause pain, either through callousness or intentional selfishness. I don't know what their reason was. They aren't the ones that are important in this thing. Yeah. It's you. Your pain is real. Put a name to it. And then stand like I did and face the north. And in your heart, pay attention, in your heart, start to love them. But what's really cool about this is your head might not be involved in it. Your head might still be wishing that they would die a long, slow painful death. <laughs> People that drive slow in the fast lane. <laughs> no. Those are the people to the north. Yeah. In your heart is where it starts. What's cool about this is that God can come into your heart even before he comes into your head. Mm. So if your head's not involved, you can ask God to bypass your head and come into your heart and help you to love them through you. That's what I did. Yes. I stood right here and I said, God, I need you to love them through me. I need you to put your love for them in me because I don't have it in my head. Mm -hmm. And I definitely don't have it in my actions. Now, I'm telling you what's going to happen if you do this and if you do it over and over again, eventually it'll click into your head. Yeah. Your heart will get to your head eventually. Yeah. If you do it, if you proclaim love, if you allow, and this, this it's, it's all a matter of obedience. It has nothing to do with what you want or what you think. It has everything to do with you simply choosing to be obedient. And you read 1 John, you'll see this is all in there about how important it is for us to love others because he loved us. And there's a correlation. The more you do this, the more you, the, the more you do this thing where you open yourself and you face the north and you say, God, I want to love those people. I don't think it. I don't want action. I don't have the actions. But God, I want to love them. So, sorry, Kathy, you just happen to be in the way. And I'm yawning. But I, I love those people. I, I want to love them. Jesus, I don't have it in me. I, I my, my, my thoughts are not good, but my heart wants to be pure. Yes. And so God help me to love them. And you start speaking love. Yes. And you start, and it might not be to the north and the west for you. It might be some other direction. I don't care how you do it. But you face the people 
in your mind. I don't have to go talk to the people that hurt me. This is not about that. This is about you getting your heart right, you opening your heart to God loving people through you and projecting it out because when you do that, you open yourself and God's love can pour into you in a way that you never thought was possible. When we do communion today, there's supposed to be healing in communion. Amen. Because communion is intimacy with God. Yes. It's coming into intimacy with Him. It's coming into agreement with all the power of God's love. It's opening yourself to God's love. That's why they told that's why the Bible said when you do communion, if you have something against your brother or sister, you need to get rid of that and take care of it before you do communion. Because if you don't, that's why in the scripture it says, Many are sickly among you and many are asleep, many are died. You know that 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 got all twisted around. The reason why we're not experiencing healing in communion is because we're not, we're not opening ourselves completely and allowing the love of God into our heart. And the thing that's keeping us from doing it is the pain that we suffered, the, the rejection or the hurt that came into our life through some outside force. Yes. And you need to stand and open yourself and you need to start speaking love yes. out, yes. out, out. God, help me to love these people. Help me to love them. God, bless them. Yes. Love them. Love them through me. Through me, God. Bring your love down through me, out to them. So when we do communion today, mm -hmm. take the elements. Face the West, because that, to me, is where God's perfection is. And you embrace that. You embrace that perfection of God's love, God's creation. You get in the picture here, mm -hmm. everything that comes out of there is, is perfection. That's where God created me to be perfect. Mm -hmm. I'm embracing that. But then as I celebrate communion, I'm going to stern and I'm going to face the north. And I'm going to project it out. Because in communion, I'm coming into agreement. I'm coming into intimacy with him. And I'm not going to take communion today with something in my heart that is impure. Yeah. Or some kind of bitterness or hurt. And, and I, I'll, I'll promise you this. Any kind of bitterness or anger, resentment, unforgiveness that you have, most all the time it can be traced back to real pain. Real pain. Real, pain, real hurt. Yeah. Sometimes we forget that. And so we don't even understand the, the bitterness and anger that's down deep inside of it. By the way, this was something that was deep inside of me this week that, that had to come out. Yeah. Because I didn't even realize it was there. Yeah. And I didn't start making these connections. I tell, I'm telling you, I've been on a, a, a whirlwind ride the last 24 hours with God. Mm -hmm. And he's been showing me stuff about myself. About, about something that happened deep down inside of me, and I need to let that out. I need to open. And you do it, you do it through, the, through the, the most powerful force in the universe, and that's the force of love. Mm. Just like God loved you, you can release it out to them by allowing that love to flow through you. Because what's happening, what's happening is that we are sort of, in a sense, choking off the amount of love that we live in. Mm. It's not the amount that's available to you. Mm. But it, it would be sort of like, it would be sort of like, you know, they tell us we need to breathe deeper. But it would be sort of like you go on through your, your whole life just taking short, shallow little breaths. You'll never get the full amount of oxygen into your system. You'll never be healthy if you don't breathe deep. The deeper you breathe, in fact, you ought to do this several times a day. You ought to just relax and you ought to 
Breathe deep. It's a good thing to do physically because what it does is it gets oxygen into your system and it, and it, it does all kinds of good things for you. But we need to do the same thing spiritually. Yes. We, need to, we need to breathe the love of God deeply. Mm. But the problem is if you're not giving it out, if you're not, if you're not, if you're choking it off, if you're if you're closed off, that's what you're doing, is you're you're going through life. You're like trying to run a marathon because that's what life is like. And you're going through all these challenges and problems and issues, and you have all these things going on in your life, and it's like you're running a marathon with two suitcases in your hand, and, and yet at the same time you're just trying to take real shallow little breaths. Mm -hmm. You ever watch a you ever watch a long distance runner run? They breathe deep. They have to because they're they're dying for oxygen. I remember when I was in high school, I ran the the uh, eight hundred, and and I remember coming across the finish line after running this this grueling race. It was, and uh, I remember not feeling like there's just not enough air, and just just taking huge big gulps of air. That's the way we need to be with God's love. We need to suck it in. But you can't do that if you're not letting it out. Yeah. If you're going to suck in air, you got to breathe it out. Yeah. Because every time you breathe, breathe oxygen in, what happens is the oxygen goes into your blood. Your blood goes through your body. It takes all the impurities out of your body, brings it back into your lungs. The air that you breathe out is full of poison carbon dioxide, it'll kill you. If, if we sucked all the oxygen out of this room and replaced it with carbon dioxide, we would all die. Yeah. Well, that's what people do, is they want to breathe in and breathe in, but they don't ever breathe out. They're literally choking themselves. Mm. Stand and face the north and breathe it out. Mm. I want to show you one other thing that's really cool. God showed me when he was showing me all this. When I stand and face the West and I praise God for his creation and I thank God for his love and I breathe in all of that goodness, all of that love of God and I just let it flow over me and I swim in the ocean and I enjoy the presence of God and then I turn and I breathe that love back out. If you'll notice right behind Kathy... I'm breathing out all of these blessings. And I'm breathing it out. And I'm pouring it out. And I'm projecting it out that way. On this table is my whole family. My children. They're all pictures of, of, of my children, my grandchildren, my family. And as I was doing this, God pointed out to me, the Holy Spirit pointed out to me, he said, You've been praying for your family. You've been praying for your children. Well, now what you're doing is you're literally prophesying love through your whole family. Yes. Yes. Folks, this is so deep today. There is a depth to this. There is a profoundness to this that will rock your world. Mm. It starts with you recognizing and realizing and walking in this profound love that yes. God wants you to walk in. Not based on your, on your personality, on your sin, on your activity. It's all based on Him. It comes from Him. It comes from His very essence of who He is and what He is. Yes. And it's available to you in such an abundance of that you can't even imagine. And all I can tell you is no matter how much of this you have walked in up till this point in your life, he has more available to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Don't choke it off. Don't choke it off. Let it go. Let that love flow through you. The love of God wants to pour through you. Thank you Jesus. And you will walk in abundance. Thank you, Jesus.